So this talk is another of the series that I've given on various cruise ships and is one of my favourites. I chose the title Children of Another Son as a deliberate double meaning because we're going to talk about the planets of other stars and we're also going to talk about the possibility that those planets might have their own life on them. So our neighbouring planetary system looks like this. These are some images that I've taken from my home observatory here just outside Cambridge. So along the top row we have Mercury, always very difficult to take a decent image of because it's uh, so small and always so near the sun in the sky that the uh, background sky is always rather bright. Then we've got the crescent of Venus. Now you can see Venus in the sky this evening, very, very bright indeed. Um, but all we ever see is the cloud tops, of course, because of such a thick atmosphere, which we've talked about in some of the other talks in this series. Then I've got a nice little image of Mars showing the polar caps and some of the dark regions and the dusty red deserts and even a little bit of wispy ice cloud in the morning sky on Mars there. Now those three, plus the Earth of course, are the inner rocky planets of the solar system. And then along the bottom we've got the gas giants. Jupiter with its cloud belt and great red spot. Saturn with its amazing rings. A little bit smaller than Jupiter, but of course it looks even smaller here because these are real images are all taken to uh, a common camera, so Saturn being further away looks disproportionately small. And then the green and the blue dots of Uranus and Neptune even further away and really difficult for uh, an amateur to image at all in fact. So that's what the uh, planetary neighbours in our backyard look like and it would be quite a surprise if our sun was alone in having such a family of planets. In our galaxy alone there are around 400 billion stars this of course is not a picture of our galaxy. We uh, live inside it and therefore we can't get a spacecraft to go far enough up above the plane of the galaxy and look down and see such a marvellous uh, array of spiral arms. But uh, this is a neighbouring galaxy taken uh, showing that yellow colour in the nucleus and the bluer colours of the stars in the spiral arms plus a lot of dirty brown dusty regions and of course it's those dirty dark brown dusty regions that are of interest from the point of view of uh, possible planet formation. Now without many, with that many stars in the galaxy it would be very strange if our solar system was the only star to have a family of planets as I said but until the late 20th century that still remained a possibility. Of course we've now discovered that there are thousands of others out there and this talk really is the story of that discovery. But for a very long time there were ideas that our sun might have had a freak encounter with another star that had pulled a streamer of material off it and that the planets had condensed from that and that that would mean that planetary systems would be incredibly rare. And uh, so we might be the only one in the Milky Way galaxy, for example, to have any planets at all. It's very difficult to answer the question and a lot of speculation went on during the, the last century, but we do now know the answer. So the question really is how? And the problem with trying to detect planets around other stars is they're very, very difficult to spot. Planets of course only reflect the light of their parent star and don't shine on their own and so this neighbouring star is around about one billion times brighter than a typical planet as seen from the Earth. And so it's like trying to see a firefly next to a searchlight as in this uh, graphic here, only much much worse, the difference is even greater. But surprisingly scientists being such clever people have managed to do it. 
And what they use is a device called a coronagraph, which was originally invented for studying the atmosphere of the sun by creating a mini eclipse inside the telescope. What you can see in this picture is a white and blue uh, mass of light with a shadow of a round disc being held by two arms. That disc, the black disc in the center there, is creating a miniature eclipse, blocking out the direct path from the light from the star. And some of the light, of course, is escaping around it by diffraction. No instrument is ever perfect. And that's what's giving the white and the blue fringes around the central obstruction. But what it has enabled uh, us to do is to block out that starlight and reveal the planet below. The little red dot is uh, the planet Beta Pictoris AB. And it was imaged directly using this instrument in 2003. That was the first time that we'd actually imaged a planet of another star. And it's a very nice, sharp little image in its own right. The same technique's been used here with an obscuring disc in the center of the optical path to block out the light from the star former hole. And it's created this uh, diffraction pattern around it that looks rather like the eye of Sauron, if anyone's familiar with Lord of the Rings. But we have a little tiny inset there showing a little dot and it's moved between 2004 and 2006 and that is a planet forming in the dust ring around former Holt now it's a growing planet and the big ring of dust around is real the ring of red dust in that image is part of the dust ring out of which the planetary material is being uh, gathered together by gravity and formed into what will turn out to be a family of new planets i'm sure it's another coronagraph type image, and this time we've caught a whole family of planets. The blue and red mess in the middle is the stray light that we have tried to block out from the direct image of the star, and it's revealed three little red dots marked B, C and D there around this particular star, which goes by the uh, catalogue number uh, 8799. This is from 2008. And what you can see here is that for some reason that I'm not entirely sure about, we uh, start labeling the planets in the order of discovery rather than from the inside out. And we start with B, there is no A. So B is the first one to be discovered, then C and then D. And they stick to those names and the order of discovery because if they discovered another inner planet or outer planet, then obviously they would have to give it the next letter. And if we tried to do it from inside out or outside in, we'd be perpetually renaming them as new ones were found. So it would be chaos. So these are attempts to directly image planets around other stars. But before we had these modern instruments and these uh, special coronagraph telescopes that enabled this, other systems were tried for detecting planets, more indirect perhaps. One of them was to not try and look for the light of the planet, but try and look for the influence of the planet on its parent star. And you can do this by tracking the motion of the star across the sky, which works best for nearby stars because the apparent movement across the sky is much greater if they're fairly near to us. But if they have a companion planet, then the planet will orbit the star, but it will induce a small wobble in the motion of the star because in fact, both are orbiting the common center of mass in the same way as uh, you have a, a fat person and a thin person sitting on a seesaw. And if you observe the star moving across the sky, you might expect to see some data showing its position in both the uh, right ascension and declination, that's the longitude and the latitude on the sky, wobbling backwards and forwards as it progressed along its path, a bit as illustrated in that bottom image there. And a scientist called Peter van der Kamp, a Dutchman, decided to have a go at doing this 
and for his target he chose Barnard Star, one of the sun's small red dwarf neighbours. And a very wise choice because it's very nearby, it has a high motion across the background of stars as it's uh, orbiting around the galaxy as we do, but at slightly different rates. So the position changes quite fast. And also with it being a small star, it's going to be more easily influenced by the gravity of a decent sized planet rather than trying to see the motion in a very large star where you'd need a very, very large planet in order for there to be a detectable wobble. So he was uh, quite wise in choosing this one. And he duly announced that he had dis made the discovery of a wobble and therefore of an extrasolar planet. In fact, that data that I showed of that wobble is Peter's data plotted from 1950 to 1980 there. And you can see he's put a sinusoidal wave through the observations that are marked with the little round circles. And it looks like there is roughly a 10 year period to that wobble. And so the orbit of the planet would be around about 10 years. Unfortunately for Peter, there is a bit of a problem. Nobody else was able to replicate this and a lot of arguments pursued from it. But in the end, I'm afraid the discovery was made that it was a better answer to put a straight line through the first part of the data there and another one there and a third straight line there. And the reason those were chosen was because it turned out the engineering department came along and did maintenance to the telescope in 1962 and put it back together, slightly differently calibrated. And you guessed it, 10 years later, they came and did it again. So the 10 year cycle was the 10 year engineering uh, plan rather than an orbit of a planet, unfortunately. And they disrupted his data in the process. So uh, poor old Peter was uh, unfortunately wrong. But in a strange twist of fate, in uh, 2018, the BBC announced on their website the discovery of planet Barnard B, orbiting around, you guessed it, Barnard's star. So I think this is a nice end to the story. Uh, it turns out that there was a planet there after all, it's just that uh, Peter's technique wasn't really sensitive enough to find it. It's not a particularly large planet, 3.2 times the mass of the Earth, and in a Venus-like orbit of 233 days around its uh, little red dwarf star. Of course, being a red dwarf star, it's not putting out very much heat. And so even though uh, in our solar system, Venus is incredibly hot, at the same distance from a red dwarf star, it's a chilly minus 160 degrees centigrade, so quite a cold planet as it turns out. But the idea of looking for planets using a wobble of the star turned out to be very fruitful. This slide illustrates a better way of getting at and detecting and measuring that wobble, and it's called the radial velocity method. What you can do is use the light coming from the star and determine whether the star is moving relative to you by the Doppler shift of the light. If the star is moving away from you, the light is shifted to the red end of the spectrum. And if it's moving towards you, then it's shifted to the blue end of the spectrum. This is very similar to a police car going whizzing past where the pitch of the siren will go from high when it's coming towards you to low when it's going away from you. And the same effect works with light, it changes the energy. So the energy is lowered and the wavelength stretched when it's moving away from you. And the wavelength is compressed, made higher energy as it's coming towards you and higher energy we see in our eyes as blue and lower as red. And you can detect it by looking at the spectrum of the light coming from the star and observing exactly where the little absorption lines from the different chemical elements in the atmosphere of the star occur. And you can see those move backwards and forwards as the relative velocity of the star changes. 
and that tells you what you need to know in order to find that there is a planet orbiting around it because if you plot that relative velocity as the star wobbles you'll get a nice wavy line with your observations which will tell you the period and position of the planet relative to the star and that works very well even with uh, cases as in the little graphic there where the center of gravity be between the star and the planet might still lie within the star so you can really make much more sensitive measurements than in, uh, using this method than you ever could hope to do with the pure astrometry method uh, relying on seeing the motion of the star directly and that was the first method that really led to the discovery of planets around other stars. Professor Didier Quailoz and his colleagues detected the planet 51 Peg B using this method back just at the end of the uh, 1990s. But another method of doing it is to rely upon luck as to the orientation of the planet's orbit around its parent star carrying it across the line of sight the so-called transit method the idea is if the planet wanders across in front of the star it will block out some of the light this is an image of the planet venus going in front of the sun which i took back in uh, 2004 i think it was and uh, the uh, little black dot at the bottom there is venus it shows how enormous the sun is compared to venus and of course venus and the earth are about the same size but the point is that as that occurred a little tiny fraction of the total amount of light that we would normally get from the sun was blocked out now of course we didn't notice that um, in the everyday variability uh, that we see with the weather and all the rest of it on earth but with very sensitive instruments uh, you can detect it and the idea would be you would stare at a star measuring its brightness and watch for a planet moving across in front of the star and see that the uh, output level that you were measuring it with your uh, measuring device dropped and then went back to normal as the planet got out of the way and the best place to do this to get away from all the interfering aspects of the Earth's atmosphere is to go to space and NASA decided to do this and launched the Kepler Space Telescope and the Kepler Space Telescope was designed to stare in one direction at one path of sky marked out there with the grid just away from the Milky Way just off uh, the, to the side there and it stared at it for five years measuring the brightness of 150,000 stars over and over and over again continuously now it found 3,000 transits that looked like planets moving in front of their parent star and if we do the maths we can work out that with a collection of stars and planets all scattered across the sky with their orbits completely at random in terms of alignment I mean there's nothing special about the direction of line of sight to the earth so why would they be lined up they should be completely randomly distributed there's about a 1 in 50 chance of a planet being in the right orbit to for us to see a transit here on earth well, and what's amazing is that 3,000 out of 150,000, 2% is precisely 1 in 50. And so we expected out of a random sample to find no more than 3,000. And that would tell us that all stars have planets. And so that's the result that we have here. Uh, it's uh, subject to statistics, and it might have been slightly freaky, but the odds are that uh, we were seeing the real case that almost every star we can reliably say has got at least one planet in fact the detection of planets now has gone up to something like 6,000 and quite a few of these stars have got multiple planets this is a poster that's on the wall in the Institute of Astronomy at Cambridge and it's uh, an artist's 
representation, I might, must add, of what the relative sizes of all of the planets that had been found when the poster was produced were looking like. So there were a lot of Jupiter-like planets, some of them bit, a bit bigger, some of them down to the size of Neptune, and then a reasonable number of smaller planets getting on down towards the size of the Earth, and some planets that were in between the two. Now, of course, when we're looking for planets, whether we're using the radial velocity method or the transit method, it turns out to be biased because a large planet is going to be much easier to find than a smaller one. A Jupiter-sized planet will block out a hundred times more light as it passes in front of the parent star than a small Earth-like planet will just because of its size and it will also, due to its larger mass, make a greater wobble for the radial velocity method to latch onto. And so we were starting to find very big planets, some of them many times the size of Jupiter, and gradually as the instruments are getting better we're finding more and more of the smaller ones. Now of course we're very interested in Earth-like planets and scientists have come up with an Earth similarity index to try to rank some of these. We've set the Earth similarity index of the Earth to be one, I suppose that makes sense, and Mars to be two-thirds, 0.66. And that allows us to classify the other worlds that we're discovering. And the nearest that we have to getting a perfect score of one so far is Gliese 581G on the left there, where they've given it a score of 0.92. So that's really very Earth-like indeed. If you look at the other end of that list, there you'll see Gliese 581D. So that's a, another planet in the same system. And in fact, here's a little diagram showing the Gliese 581 system compared in, uh, against our own solar system. We've got the, the Sun and the four inner planets and Jupiter shown in our solar system, with the blue band being the habitable zone. And of course the Earth nicely snug in the habitable zone is just warm enough for life, warm enough for liquid water to be on the surface, it's not too hot. Venus is perhaps on the too hot side there, on the inner side of that, and Mars actually in the more frigid part of the solar system, slightly further away from the sun in the outer edge of what you might consider the habitable zone. But of course, being a smaller planet, it uh, doesn't retain its heat so well. But if we look at Gliese 581, it's a red dwarf star. The, all the Gliese stars are a catalogue of red dwarfs. And um, it has planets B, C, D, E, F and G there. And G is right slap bang in the habitable zone in the uh, region that's going to be at a nice sensible temperature for liquid water oceans on its surface. And D, a larger planet, sneaking in at the outer edge of the habitable zone. So those two are the two that are scoring quite high on that Earth similarity index. So very similar solar system to our own in some ways. Here's another one, this is uh, the 55 Cancri system, and it's got a small red dwarf star in the middle, and a group of inner rocky planets, and a Jupiter-like planet in a further out orbit. So this is looking really quite like our own home solar system, and that's interesting, that's just going to show that there isn't really anything very unique at all about uh, the, the uh, Earth and uh, its family of planets and the sun. Another one here, Kepler 62. Again, we've got a red dwarf star with a habitable zone and a couple of interesting planets nicely in that, with 62 F there being right in the center of that habitable zone. But we have found some planets that are not like any that are in our own solar system. These are the super Earths. They're bigger than the Earth, but smaller than Neptune or Uranus. They're not gas giants or ice giants. They're not small rocky planets either. 
And here, Kepler 22b, we've got an artist's impression of what it might look like. It's uh, 2.4 times the size of the Earth. And because it's uh, that much bigger in radius, its mass is perhaps five to eight times the mass of the Earth, with a correspondingly much larger volume, you see. But it's still a lot less than the 16 to 20 Earth masses that you find for Neptune-like worlds. And we are starting to find quite a lot of these. Now, the interesting idea with these super Earths is because they will have probably got a rocky core, but a larger one, with therefore correspondingly larger surface gravity, they're probably going to hang on to volatile liquids and volatile gases like water much more easily. And so the speculation is that these perhaps would have so much water that there would be no dry land at all, or they would be pure ocean worlds completely covered in water to the depths of hundreds of kilometers. And a very interesting and different class of world. So that's uh, Kepler 22b. And it orbits another fairly modest star on the inner edge of the habitable zone. So it's probably at a nice warm temperature. And again, that's suggestive of liquid water oceans. I imagine that uh, it might have a very warm and steamy atmosphere into the bargain and could uh, have a bit of a runaway greenhouse effect because it is on the inner edge of that uh, habitable zone. And for a large planet, you perhaps want to be a bit further out. Well, what about our nearest stellar neighbours then? The, the Alpha Centauri system contains the small red dwarf star Proxima Centauri, the actual nearest star to the sun, just 4.2 light years away. And indeed, it has a planet, Proxima b, and it's an Earth-sized planet. You can see we have a quarter of the sun shown here. We've got Proxima Centauri, a red dwarf star shown to scale and the same scale images of Jupiter, Saturn, Proxima b and the Earth. Now this was uh, determined by the radial velocity method and the graph of the data showing the orbit of Proxima b in that periodic uh, wobble there at the top. Now it's uh, an orbit that's quite a lot shorter than our own but of course that brings it closer in and closer in is what you want if you're orbiting a cool star like Proxima. And it turns out that it's in the habitable zone. But there is an issue with these red dwarf stars, which is that for the first few hundred million years of their life, they tend to be very, very uh, unruly and produce an awful lot of solar flares on the outside, the super flares. And that pushes the output of heat up, pushes the habitable zone further away. And so it's quite possible that Proxima b formed too close to its star and was too hot for a couple of hundred million years. And that might have stripped away any water that it was born with. Now, 200 million years later, the habitable zone has moved inwards as the star has settled down. But the question for us really is, did Proxima b have any water left at the end of it or had it been burnt to a crisp? Now actually we don't really understand where our own water on earth has come from. We think it might have been delivered later by a storm of comets or asteroids bringing a lot of water and crashing into the earth. So maybe Proxima b will also have picked up a dose of water after the star has cooled down and settled down it remains to be seen. We need to study this more closely and look at other methods of trying to determine what is going on on Proxima b before we can say any more. Now I've always been very interested in the, the idea of uh, planets around other stars and I did a lot of work with the Kepler Space Telescope using the data that was publicly available and um, this is the planet that I found. I used the Planet Hunters program and between myself and four other amateurs, we detected three transits. Here is the one that I found. 
that data shows the brightness measurements as individual dots with time going across the horizontal axis. And you can see that it was bouncing around. There are flares, there are star spots, there's all sorts of confounding uh, data. But then suddenly it took a nice dip and came back up again. And that was repeated on two other different dates. And the gaps between these three made us able to determine the period of this uh, particular planet. And the planet goes by the exciting name of KIC 9147029B, because that's the Kepler input catalogue number at the top there. So it's 157 light years away in the constellation of Cygnus. Well, it would be, that's the only bit of sky that uh, Kepler looked at. And the star, 9147029, is a star about 80% of the mass of the Sun. But it's a little bit more evolved. And we detected these transit dips every 397 and a half days. So that's 13 months apart, three of them. And each time the light dropped it by 0.3%. So it's a very small drop you're looking for, actually. But 0.3% tells us how much light was blocked by the planet. And it tells us the size of the planet and that works out to be about the same size as Neptune. Now the interesting, uh, oh, up to this, up at the top left there, we've got uh, the star itself in negative image. We're not actually able to see the planet directly, but the star is F-type and 200 degrees C hotter on its surface than our sun. And a 0.3% drop in the light, and a 397 and a half day, 13 month orbit puts the Neptune sized planet at 1.1 astronomical units from its uh, central star. So it's a little bit further away from a hotter fire and it's right in the habitable zone. And it was one of the first habitable planets to be discovered or in the habitable zone rather, not necessarily actually habitable, it's we don't know the nature of it yet, but uh, was one of the first planets to lie in the habitable zone discovered by the Kepler data. Now the planet itself at Neptune sized might not be somewhere you would want to go for your holidays if it's uh, an ice giant or a gas giant or a warm gas giant or something like that might be uh, quite uh, an unpleasant environment. But we've got to remember in our solar system if you've uh, listened to my talk, Fire and Ice, the Volcanic Worlds of the Solar System, you'll recognize these images of at the top left Europa, at the bottom right Enceladus, Ceres there, and Titan, and in even uh, there are others in our solar system that have potential habitable zones within the uh, worlds themselves, inside, protected by an ice covering, these water, ice, uh, warm, briny oceans that uh, could be somewhere that life could evolve. And of course, it's entirely possible that KIC 9147029b, being the size of Neptune, is going to have its own family of moons. So maybe there could be a habitable moon orbiting around this gas giant at just the right distance from the sun to have itself a habitable surface and with the Kepler data people have started to go looking for these and Kepler 1625b is a 10 Jupiter mass planet and it has a Neptune sized moon orbiting it. it was the first exo moon to be discovered but the latest news is that, uh, we've had a look at 76 of the habitable zone planets around sun-like stars, so G-type stars, thus sadly ignoring mine because it's an F-type star, and the transit times of the main planet vary slightly if they've got a decent sized moon because the planet and the moon are orbiting around their common center of mass and so if it happens that as the transit across the face of the star occurs, the uh, moon is leading along the orbit, then the 
planet will be delayed slightly. And if the moon is in a different position around its orbit and trailing along the line of sight, then the uh, main planet will arrive a little early. And we've been able to detect that. And it looks like we're beginning to time these sufficiently accurately to prove the existence of quite a few of these exomoons. So uh, the science continues. Now, what we really want to be able to do is characterize not just the orbits and perhaps the masses of these uh, planets and their sizes. And of course, if we have the size and the mass, we can work out the average density and start to make guesses about uh, what they might be made of. But what we really want to do is study their atmospheres and see if we can find signs of life. Now, the way you might go about doing that is to split the light from the planet up into its spectrum and see if you can measure the characteristic dips in the uh, light curve corresponding to the wavelengths that are absorbed by molecules that are associated with life. So perhaps oxygen or ozone might be a, a good thing to go and look for in the atmospheres of these planets. I tried the technique and it works. We tried it in our own solar system and the good news was we were able to detect life on Earth. So the blue trace across the top there is the Earth and you can see that there is a very pronounced dip uh, for ozone and for carbon dioxide and a signature of water there. We also looked at the light from the uh, planet Venus and saw no ozone, lots of carbon dioxide of course, and for Mars there at the bottom the red trace just carbon dioxide, a lesser signature because it's a smaller planet with a thinner atmosphere. But we can do this and it's amazing that we can for planets around other stars and the Kepler-2 mission has detected water in a Goldilocks zone planet around the star K2-18. So K2-18b has water vapor making up about 50% of its atmosphere. And this is one of those super Earths. The mass is around eight times that of the Earth, the radius 2.7 times that of the Earth, and it's orbiting its uh, rather small star at uh, a period of 33 days, so its year is 33 of our Earth days long. Just 0.14 astro uh, astronomical units from its parent star. At that distance it's getting 94% of the heat that we get from our Sun, and so the temperature would be around minus 8 to plus 5 degrees before any greenhouse effect. And with that much water vapor in the atmosphere, that's going to give it quite a substantial uh, boost in temperature. The water is a very powerful greenhouse gas and lift the temperature up. So this is probably quite a warm, steamy planet. And it, of course, might have a very deep water ocean underneath the atmosphere. Be highly likely. Now, in terms of discovering sheer numbers of planets, we've got the Gaia spacecraft up there mapping one billion stars, and it's also looking to see if it finds radial velocity variations and transits. And it's expected that the Gaia data, once it's been fully released, is going to yield around about a million planets. Um, and this is going to be absolutely uh, enormous amount of work to go and follow up uh the uh the, all these planets that we will then know about i just uh, can't imagine the the changes that have occurred in our knowledge from 20 years or so ago where we really didn't know if there were any out there at all there's another couple of spacecraft tests the terrestrial planet finder and cheops which is uh looking to study the atmosphere's density and composition of uh planets so they're picking nearby Earth-like stars and looking at them in great detail and measuring the atmosphere. And uh, we should learn a lot from these once their data is in. They've only just started to come up with some results this year. So the amazing thing is that we haven't had a case like this. I've certainly never seen a fleet of spacecraft crossing the sky. 
And great Enrico Fermi came up with the uh, quote at the bottom there. So where is everybody? There are so many stars out there, 400 billion in our galaxy alone. Most of them we know have planets and families of planets. And there's a lot of them that are very, very old, and even some that are much older than the Earth. So why are we not seeing aliens flying around all over the place? Perhaps you are, but personally I never have. So we can start to try and answer this question by dissecting it down a bit. And first of all, I think the nature of the star is important. Probably best it's not too old. It was formed a long, long time ago when the universe was very young. It, the universe would also have been very clean. Stars are nuclear pressure cookers for the elements. They cook up new material and when they die, throw it back out to be formed into second and third generations of planetary systems. And we think our own uh, solar system is a third generation of this process. And if you don't have those elements that are cooked up inside the cores of giant stars like iron, which is in our blood, and oxygen, which we breathe, and all the other elements that go together to make biochemistry the rich and complex process that it is, you really can't get very far. So stars that are too old probably don't have very many planets. If the star's too young, well, it seems from our one example here on Earth that it took an awful long time for complex creatures to evolve. The uh, Earth has had signs of life on it, and the most recent I've uh, read about date back to 3.8 billion years ago, out of the 4 billion years since the Earth had a molten surface and wouldn't have been habitable. So there's been life on Earth almost the entire lifespan of the Earth, bar that first 200 million years perhaps. But it takes an awful long time before concrete, uh, complex creatures manage to uh, discover the trick of evolving to produce the, the rich, diverse life we see around. That's really only a very recent phenomenon. The other thing you don't want of your star is for it to be too big because massive stars live fast and die young. They start off burning at a very, very high temperature and they rush through their nuclear fuel uh, disproportionately rapidly until they explode as a supernova. So I wouldn't recommend that for somewhere to have a planet, especially as, as we've just discussed, it takes a very long time for evolution to do its work. And you perhaps don't want your star to be too small either. Small stars have narrow habitable zones, and as we were talking about with Proxima b, those uh, habitable zones can move as the star evolves. And so maybe it's difficult for a planet to remain in the habitable zone of a small star. But I'm not so sure about this one. Uh, there are other factors at work. It also matters as to where you are in your host galaxy. If you're right in the middle, in the core, the stars are really closely packed together. In, uh, you might have binary or multiple star systems. You might be part of a cluster or the nucleus of the galaxy where it's not very far to another star system and a very spectacular for astronomers, but also uh, every chance that you're going to have a supernova blow up nearby very, very soon because uh, just of the sheer statistics of how many stars there are. The same applies really to the spiral arms where a lot of new stars get formed and along with new stars you get giant stars being formed and they of course blow up as supernovae and they can sterilize planets within a few hundred light years of themselves quite easily with all the gamma rays that come off when they explode. There's a, a supernova that uh, is the most recent one we've actually caught on film this was in the Large Magellanic Cloud in 1987, 160,000 light years away, so it's far enough away in distant space not to be uh, a nuisance to us at all. But if you had one in your backyard, that would be very bad. I know there's been a lot of speculation recently about the star Betelgeuse, which seemed to be dimming and changing. 
uh, that's also too far away from us to do us any harm if it blew up as a supernova. It's about 600 light years away and uh, we reckon 100 light years is the safety zone. So I've already said we need all that long period of time. Here's an illustration of the rise of life way back at 4 billion years uh, just after. And you can see that for about another 2 billion years, all there was on Earth was simple single-celled organisms. And it was really only in the last 500 million years from the uh, age of the trilobites onwards that uh, anything very interesting happened leading up to uh, the nautilus and plants and dinosaurs and small furry creatures and astronomers right at the last minute there. And we really are very, very new and novel indeed. But you've also got to not have a catastrophe. This is a plot of the last 500 million years and each spike is a mass extinction. The, uh, the one that's uh, second from the right, that's underneath the, the K and PG uh, boxes at the top there, which are the uh, Cretaceous and the modern era. That's the 66 million year ago annihilation of the dinosaurs. But you can see there have been other mass extinctions the worst one being between the P, Permian and Triassic periods there, where a very large slice of the life on Earth was wiped out. And uh, if this happens too often, then you, know, you keep getting your uh, biological evolution reset back to uh, much simpler organisms. It could be quite a limitation for getting sophisticated life. I mentioned the trilobites, here they are, they ruled the earth for 270 million years, so that's uh, an awful lot longer than uh, humans have been on earth. We've been around for perhaps two million years, so the trilobites have outdone us by a hundred and something to one so far, but they came to a sticky end at 444 million years ago, and quite likely that it was a very large star, a hypergiant star, undergoing the collapse in the center of its core and creating a hypernova, which generates a gamma ray burst of enormous power. And there's evidence that uh, those gamma rays wiped out an enormous slice of the uh, creatures on the, the, the earth, even down into some of the shallow oceans. And we've detected the radio isotope signature of this gamma ray burst. And I mentioned the uh, old dinosaurs, it was astronomy that got them as well. This time it was an incoming space rock that smashed into the earth just off the coast of Mexico and uh, set fire to all the woods and forests of the earth all in one go and also threw enormous amounts of sulfur dioxide up into the sky because it just so happened it landed right in the worst place in a portion of the uh, earth's crust where there are a lot of sulfates. So there was probably a hundred years of the climate being completely wrecked as this mega impact occurred. Actually, it could have been part of a shower of comets because there are some other craters of roughly the same age that we're beginning to find as well. So the story on that one's still evolving. And I must say, there are some people that think that this was actually all due to uh, giant eruptions of volcanoes over in India, the so-called Deccan Traps, that were happening around about the same time. And perhaps the both were uh, occurring and both were partly responsible. Perhaps the uh, volcanoes were doing the climate quite a lot of damage and the asteroid was the killer punch that finished the uh, dinosaurs off. And so really the question about where is everybody comes down to one giant Goldilocks uh, effect. Your solar system not to be, needs to be not too clean, so you've got some interesting chemistry. Certainly needs to be not too exciting from the point of view of catastrophes. The star needs to be not too big and not too small, just right, so it's hot enough, stable and lives a long time. And the planet needs to be not too near and not too far and just the right size. Because remember, we could pick all of those criteria off. You might have discovered a nice warm planet in the habitable zone, well, like the one I did. Nice stable star, yes, KIC 9147029 is perfectly stable. It's in a nice quiet neighbourhood. 
planet may well have liquid water on its oceans, or if it doesn't, it may have a moon that does. And it's probably billions of years old, and so had plenty of time for complex life to evolve. Maybe it's even got intelligent beings there. Maybe those beings can communicate. But we still might not hear from them, because you can tick all of those boxes for the Earth. Uh, and this guy, he lives in the water, and he's very smart. He can communicate with his own species, and uh, all, all good, except because he lives in the water, he's going to have a very hard time making fire, and therefore refining metals, building transistor radios, or building spaceships. And so we may never hear from him. And quite a lot of these habitable zones that we're finding out there in the solar system are water-based and possibly with enormous oceans either covered in ice and no land at all, or so much water that the uh, oceans are thousands of kilometers deep on many of these super Earths. They still could have incredibly smart creatures living within them, but they're probably not going to be able to do this. And I'll just leave this as the final slide of this talk. I think we must remember that the really unlikely evolutionary outcome is the one you see in front of you, humans.